get in the stage too with me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to sincerely thank everyone for joining us here today, for staying on the grid. It's such an exciting opportunity to see so many familiar faces, but also so many new ones as well. We've got such an exciting day lined up. Uh, three panels with major thinkers, creators, and writers, and people doing community work. We've also got a uh, lecture performance this evening by Hirt Lovenk, uh, uh, 
monumental figure in the field of media theory and criticism, followed by an amazing presentation by Ben Grosser and then a, a conversation afterwards. So make sure to come back for that. But today, through the early afternoon, we're going to be exploring three things. First, the sort of bankruptcy of modern platforms, or at least uh, their crisis, which you know has been splattered all over the headlines, at least for the last couple months. Second, the mental states of us in our networked internet-based culture. And then finally, people who are looking to the future of new, more equitable, more free, liberated platforms for futures that we would want to actually live in. So before we introduce this particular panel, um, I have a couple thank yous. My first thank you is for all of the Red Cat staff who are making this happen. It's such a beautiful, amazing space. And as Sarah and I were talking just a few moments ago, it's amazing to be in a room run by such professionals. <laughs> um, like to thank my co-curator and accomplice in making this all happen, Maisa, who has worked way too hard. <laughs> been there every step of the way, practical, conceptual, sending out all the emails that made this event possible, as well as Hirt's visit. And then uh, that's the third person to thank, Hirt Lovink, for being such an inspiration with his work. But also with his time, he's been spending the last four days with CalArt students doing a um, master seminar and it was six hours a day for three days straight. I mean, talk about intensive. But this is, in many ways, the culmination of those last few days. And we're so excited to be sharing it with such luminary thinkers, writers, and creators. And so we're going to start on closed source platform futures. Our first speaker is going to be Sarah Roberts, feminist researcher who broke the story of the exploitation of online content moderators, works on uh, digital labor, feminism, gender, colonialism, the list goes on and on. A uh, tenured professor at UCLA, the director of the Critical Internet Inquiry Center, and also now like leading up things in gender studies, which is so exciting. So after Sarah, we're going to have Tom Leeser, who, for those of us at CalArts, probably needs no introduction, has been working with art and tech and integrated media as a truly foundational figure, making these programs hum and be such an exciting place for activity. He's been a thinker and a writer and a curator and, a, and an artist around the internet and digital culture and so many other things. And so it's going to be quite exciting to have him um, you know, uh, keep the through line as we move into Dr. Olivia Snow, who's a writer, dominatrix, research fellow at UCLA, part of the Critical Internet Study uh, Center, also a prolific writer in both the popular and the academic. And so it's just going to be so wonderful to have the panel with these three. So without any further remarks, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Sarah. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, whoops. I thought I'd kind of tell you a story today. I hope that's all right about my, the past year or so of my life. Um, because I think it's pertinent, not just because, because I think it's relevant. Um, and it's relevant to this idea of, in general, um, maybe resting back some of the control as individuals and as communities uh, that has been seeded particularly over the last 15 years, but it's been a slow burn for a long time. And I want to think about um, a, 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 you know, a, a sort of a reckoning that I had myself and then uh, share some thoughts with you that we can talk about perhaps collectively uh, a little later on and, and get some input. So basically, um, uh, as Andrew was saying, I'm a professor at UCLA and uh, a, a researcher and an academic, and that's been my identity for, you know, uh, coming on a decade and a half. Prior to that, however, I was a, uh, I was a pretty uh, nondescript, uh, 
fairly low status, fairly low wage IT worker. And uh, I was telling my students the other day, I, I started doing that work when I was in, uh, at the university as an undergrad, and um, I was immediately hired into a job upon graduation, which was not a thing that uh, one could take for granted at that time or maybe at any time. Uh, and so I, I, I worked in that arena probably for close to 15 years as well. And you know, early on in that, I, I thought it was weird because I had trouble paying the light bill and I had trouble keeping uh, you know, basic, basic life necessities rolling. And it, it was weird because I had, it had been indicated to me that if you work in tech, you would be financially stable and on a really, yeah, somebody's laughing already. Exactly. So, um, you know, at this point in my, in my life where I was a young person, um, having come out of uh, University of Wisconsin and having studied uh, all sorts of things, uh, gender studies, history, um, other kinds of uh, fields that give you critical analysis tools, um, it occurred to me that maybe the problems were structural in nature uh, and, and not down to my own uh, personal failing as an individual. And so I started thinking about these ideas and concepts, uh, particularly as they pertain to work. And oddly enough, my employers weren't really interested in that. Um, they just wanted me to set up the computers and kind of keep it, keep it rolling. So uh, at, at a point, um, I did what every uh, uh, disaffected, uh, early 30-something person does, and I went back to school. Uh, and uh, it, during that period of time, uh, first I did a master's degree, I went on to my PhD at the University of Illinois, and this is about in 2009, 2010. In, in the summer of 2010, I came across a small article. I was on a break, I was actually TAing, and I was TAing in the summer. I was on a break, and I came across an article in the New York Times that talked about a group of low-paid, uh, low status, like minimum wage workers working in Iowa in the middle of cornfields that in a place that used to be uh, sort of like the, the heartland of the United States producing uh, grain and, and producing um, hogs and other kinds of soybeans, other kinds of um, agricultural products. But these people were not doing any agricultural labor and they were not um, you know, doing anything that I'd actually recognized before as a formalized practice for pay. What they were doing was screening internet content. And they were doing it um, at the behest of, of other firms. So they were the third party to firms that needed this service. And they were making decisions about that content with regard to its appropriateness for its intended site or platform. And this is 2007, so a lot of this was just on the, on the web. Um, but, but the uh, social media, scene as we know it was starting to really coalesce. And so with that, there was more and more need. And it occurred to me that it was a very strange phenomenon to happen in, in you know, uh, farmland Iowa. And I'm, I'm reading this article while I myself am surrounded on every side by cornfields. So, you know, it was a very similar uh, kind of uh, context. And again, coming from Wisconsin, you know, corn fed, Midwestern, it's my people, I understand it. And I was like, why on earth are, you know, why on earth would this company be in, in Iowa and what's going on? So I hit their website and uh, it immediately became clear to me what was going on because the tagline of the, the firm at the time, it's changed names many, many times since, was outsourced to Iowa, not India. That's a mic drop, everyone. <laughs> outsourced to Iowa, not India. And so it became clear to me in that moment and it really, things really crystallized that not only was this a practice that of course was necessary, of course, firms would not just open up their, uh, their branded websites or, or platforms and, and cede total control to the random uh, internet uh, people from around the world to do as they would. Um, but actually, not only would they maintain control in some way, they would do it uh, in such a way that would be friction-free, invisible to most users, and would be predicated on values and politics the kinds of values and politics that were stated right in that tagline, that there was something uh, uh, tangible and commodi commoditizable, I think, importantly, and also of greater value when you had uh, people who look a lot like me doing the decision making, not people in India or somewhere else in the world. And so that's how I began the process of studying what I call commercial content moderation, which has only grown in this period of time since 2010 when I came across this, this article that 
inspired me to kind of peel back the layers and try to find out more about this practice. Um, and in the early days, I really had to explain what content moderation was. I mean, people would argue with me that it wasn't actually occurring, that I was lying, that the companies who were so invested in freedom of speech, yeah, here it is laughing already, exactly, it's like a comedy bit, right? Um, that, that all these uh, companies that were so committed and invested to, in free speech would never deign to interfere uh, with, with one's self-expression. And furthermore, even if they were to do that, don't computers do that? Because computers are better arbiters, of course, they're more, uh, they're, they're, they're likely to be fairer, they're likely to be more consistent than, than a human being, right? Well, at the time, I went over to the center, the National Center for Supercomputing Application in Illinois, and I asked a research scientist the question I already knew the answer to, which is, would that be possible? And particularly, would it be possible at scale? And we were in a room not dissimilar to this one. It was, a, it was like a virtual reality cube at the time. That's what kind of the state of the art was. And he pointed at a table, rectangular oak table, and he said, see that? And I said, uh-huh. And he said, right now we're trying to make the computer reliably know that the table is a table. So that was the state of the art in 2010. Now, I don't mean to suggest that that's where we are in 2023, but I want you to know that the evolution has not been uh, seamless. It's, it's not without its own costs and consequences. And at the end of the day, it's very expensive to, uh, to develop and apply that kind of technology. And it just so happens that um, humans come cheap for the tech industry. So um, that having been said, um, and that's by way of contextualizing the next few things I want to share with you. Uh, around this time last year, I was preparing to take a leave of absence from UCLA, which was something that I had not planned to do whatsoever, hadn't foreseen. Uh, but everybody can use a break from their day job, right? And uh, I had been approached by a company uh, you may have heard of um, based in the Bay Area. It's called Twitter. Uh, yeah, right. Um, and they had approached me and they, they, they said, would you be interested in coming to work at Twitter on the issue of content moderation um, as a researcher and with specificity on improving the internal tools that the moderators use. And the first thing I said was, are you sure you have the right person? Because I don't really like you guys and um, I am kind of critical about this industry. But at the same time, I will fully admit that my platform of choice was Twitter. Um, there was a huge academic community on Twitter. Uh, it was pretty interesting. I, I often felt like I was working out my early ideas on Twitter, and it was a place to get engagement like with others who, who might you know, help me develop that analysis. And so after we clarified that indeed I was the one they were looking for, they explained to me that um, that the role would, would be one of a researcher working with a team of engineers and um, other, uh, other people who build things to improve tools that are infrastructurally uh, invisible uh, for the most part to almost everyone else in the company and certainly to the general public, but is the interface or space in which uh, the content moderators who are called agents at Twitter exist in every day, day in and day out. That is their interface and to their work and to their world. And it, it may come as no surprise to you to learn that these tools are not prioritized internally at any firm. They uh, are often bespoke. They're often developed by the companies themselves, at least at this kind of triple A echelon. So, you know, the Facebooks and the YouTubes of the world, they all have their own means by which they uh, do this moderation work. And it's built, it's purpose built, but it does not get the kind of funding, kind of a engineering attention. It is not a first order thing that anyone thinks about except for those who touch content moderation. And so I knew that tooling uh, and tools and their function or lack thereof or their, their relative brokenness on a given day um, was the second complaint that most moderators had just after their first complaint about the difficulty of their job, which was, of course, the content that they need to view. But as you can imagine, those two things are tied fairly, fairly closely together, almost inextricably, because if you're using crap tools that don't work, 
um, that take forever to load content, so you have to sit and watch it kind of come down your screen. Maybe you're working on from a Chromebook, uh, which a lot of people were, right? So that's not a very high-powered high computer in the first place. Um, if, if things, if you have to constantly jerry-rig the system, if things are broken, they don't work as planned, uh, that is an extra burden. And uh, naturally, um, although the firm may not have had that front of mind, they had other things front of mind like productivity and accuracy. Uh, I saw a mechanism by which we could improve the working conditions for agents at Twitter through this project. I will also admit that I was anthropologically interested <laughs> because I wanted to go, I, I had never been inside one of these firms in that capacity. And I wanted to know, you know, was, were all the things I, I had been saying for all these years true? I mean, I pretty much thought they were, but I, I wanted to find out for myself. Also, I won't lie, I needed a break from UCLA. Um, so I took this leave and I went inside Twitter and I was uh, affiliated with a research group there in what was called the um, health research area. So health has a special meaning at social media companies. They are usually talking about um, social, collective social wellness, pro-social behavior, um, and how to uh, affect that on their platforms, um, how to deal with things like election integrity, for example, terroristic threats, and of course, some of the worst of the worst content gets dealt with by full-time employees rather than contractors. So, you know, just, just child sexual abuse material and things like that might have relationships um, within the full-time employees, researchers, engineers, et cetera, at Twitter, as opposed to kind of being left to the, the frontline uh, production floor folks. And so uh, it, was, it was weird. I hadn't been in a like nine to five situation in a long time. I, I think that I'm not good with authority, which is funny because the university is the most hierarchical place on earth. But um, you know, I, I labor under the, the delusion that I don't have a boss. Um, and so it was weird, you know, I was an employee, I had a manager, all that stuff, but we started, uh, we started thinking about interventions and I, I, I came up with some things that I wanted to push for and, and, and ask for and I felt like I had buy-in. And everything was going pretty well and I was looking forward to see, seeing if this kind of intervention that I had in mind um, could do something for the agents in terms of their well-being and their, their general experience. And then, this guy called Elon Musk came along. You may have heard of him. He's kind of an asshole. Um, he came along and he started making intimations that he wanted to purchase the company. Like this was within really, I, we could count it as a matter of weeks when I got there. And his stated purpose early on was that he wanted to eliminate this is what he was claiming, that he was gonna eliminate content moderation because it was too restrictive. Um, apparently, people just couldn't express themselves enough. Uh, a lot of people had been deplatformed, you know, people who were Nazis or who issued death threats or uh, encouraged mobbing on of, of regular people with their tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of followers. I mean, people who broke the rules. And I will say of Twitter, of all the platforms, it did endeavor to really be permissive as, you know, which much to the annoyance of people in the, in the health realm because they felt like, you know, these things were counter to social well-being. So there was a lot of internal wrangling uh, even about, you know, transphobia and the use of the word grooming, for example. Why was that allowed? Why could you call people a groomer? Everybody knew what that was supposed to mean. It didn't, it, it didn't come without baggage, you know. So fights like that were going on all the time internally. And here Elon Musk comes and claims that there's too much intervention on Twitter, uh, that, that there's too much uh, meddling and he's going to get rid of it. Now, knowing what I knew about the internet and content moderation and why it exists, which is fundamentally because of brand management, uh, business to business relationships, right? Because the actual clients of a platform like Twitter are other firms, they're other advertisers. We are the product, in fact, that uh, you know, our engagement, our eyeballs, our attention, our generation of content on the platform is the, is the commodity in the case of a company like Twitter. And content moderation is used in, in large part to ensure the, to those advertisers that they will not find their product or service aligned next to, say, um, an anti-Semitic fading pop star's comments 
or something like that. You know, they don't want to be associated with that. And so content moderation, first and foremost, is about those relationships. It, it has certainly expanded into other arenas, but first and foremost, that's what it's for. And so I knew that Elon Musk was either lying or stupid or both because you cannot have a social media company predicated on relationships that are business to business and built on advertising without content moderation. Furthermore, in 2022, 2023, there are many regulatory mandates, certainly many more coming from places like the EU than the United States, which is wholly captured in, in Congress by these firms and uh, uh, really in bed with them. But there are legal mandates that have to be met and they're met by content moderation. So I knew this was disastrous because what he was proposing was impossible, but if he tried to effect it, it would be a total failure and it would be socially dangerous for the world. For most of the, the most marginalized people, the people who are most in danger already around the world, this would spell disaster. As you may know, over many months, he offered too much for the company, more than it was worth. The board of, of, of trustees at the company, the board of directors, claimed that they were doing their fiduciary duty, which I started calling their fiduciary dookie, um, their fiduciary duty to, uh, to enrich their shareholders. And while that is one vector dimension of, uh, of what fiduciary duty can be, it can also be interpreted in other ways, but they chose to go very narrowly. Now, did they stand to make multi-million dollars in this deal? Yes, they did. Was that um, incidental to this deal? I don't think so, but they'll tell a different story. And so ultimately, Elon tried to back out, as you know, and they took him to court, and he was going to probably lose. So it, in the end, he bought the company out at $54.20 a share. Four twenty, get it? <laughs> this guy just discovered pot like five years ago. I mean, it's so weird. Like, we're all living his adolescence with him, and it's the worst. So yes, the only worst thing would have been if he would have offered 69.69 per share, right? And, and that's just because it, the, the numbers were too high. But I think he would have if he could have. So yes, 54.20, and the company went private. Um, during this period, when I was still with her, I mean, I saw the writing on the wall. I knew he would come in, and the first thing that would go would be all of these um, health-related programs, things like election integrity, which was really scary given the Brazilian election and other elections, and the kind of like coordinated uh, activity that goes on and influence campaigns and so on. And at one point, he decided they, it was decided that he would come speak to the employees. So. <laughs> I pretty much got my popcorn ready that day, and uh, he 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 beamed in via Zoom. I, I, we were you know we were working remotely at the time, and uh, some people were some people were in offices. But he he beamed in via Zoom, and kicked it off uh, from a hotel room somewhere where he was holding his phone, and that's how he was zooming to the employees uh, with. Um, assistants, you know, servants, whatever, walking around behind him. And he came 15 minutes late, uh, which was weird too, had no prepared remarks, and started off, you know, with this concept of, of content moderation where he displayed utter ignorance about any of the things that I just told you. So you all know more than he did now about content moderation, right, when he came and gave this talk. And it was just ridiculous and bananas, and I was, I was completely losing it. And he started off with comments about that, and it segued into, I don't know how we made the leap, but suddenly we're talking about outer space. <laughs> and not just that, but this. Oh. <laughs> right, so aliens, okay. I mean, I would argue that there is a method to that madness. Like, why, why are these people talking about Mars and space, right? Well, it's, it's actually quite deceptively simple. This is a matter of conquest. <laughs> this is a matter of capital seeking to gain as much as it can for as little as possible, which is the equation under which we all live our lives. And uh, people like Elon Musk, who, anyone know where he's from originally? South Africa, under what? Apartheid. Yes, apartheid South Africa, his father owning a Emerald mine, yeah. Diamond mines are another big thing in South Africa. But yeah, talk about the closest thing you can get 
to enslavement of humans, to, to paying nothing for labor. The entire society arranged and predicated on that inequity. That's where he comes from. So we don't have to go far to find the ideological apple that has fallen from that tree, right? Um, and it, it looks something like this, right? Manifest destiny, conquering, pioneering. These are words, by the way, that were used in the early, uh, the early development of the social internet. When we were talking about cyberspace, I'm teaching a class right now to my students, and we're reading a lot of articles from the mid and uh, the early and mid 90s. And the word cyberspace is everywhere, alongside those kinds of um, uh, uh, words of domination and conquest. And I, I feel so. Um, dated, right, talking about cyberspace. And I did tell them the only thing that was worse than cyberspace was the information superhighway, which they had never, blissfully never heard of. <laughs> but yeah, I would argue that people like Musk and others, I mean, I'm really picking on him because I hate him. I want to be clear, like, I will not, yeah, he sucks and he's the worst. Um, you know, as they say, a, a billionaire is a failure of policy. This man doesn't pay enough taxes. He's a grifter. He's a, a you know, he's, he's um getting over on everyone, basically. But he's not the only one, right? I mean, this is just a, uh, this is just a good, uh, a, a, a good um, point of departure, I think, for this conversation. So this notion, this ideological notion of conquer and conquest and, and uh, extraction of, uh, of profit and um, sort of staking one's claim, if you will, on what we were told was borderless and infinite and uh, available to all uh, and all types of expression early on because that was what the dream was for many people. It, of course, that was a government-free dream. Um, if we think about John Perry Barlow and his declaration of the independence of cyberspace, which is very subtle, right, with the title. Like, he didn't call it John Perry Barlow's manifesto. It was the declaration of independence of cyberspace. I mean, you know, he's trying to put it up there with the founding documents of the United States. So elevating uh, the internet almost to this extra state echelon. And yet, it is filled with, with spaces that we don't own, that we don't know much about in terms of their operation or their rules or what, you know, what the product really is or who's selling what to whom and under what conditions who is capitulating to what governments under what conditions as a precursor to being in the marketplace in certain places in the world, et cetera. And you know, I find other evidence of this all over the place. Like I will give this example of Mark Andreessen who when, uh, when India very wisely rejected the Faustian bargain of, of having uh, uh, Facebook's so-called free basics foisted upon them in lieu of actually having robust internet services, they rejected that. Uh, Andreessen suggested that maybe, maybe the Indian people were just better off under colonization, right? They don't know what's good for them, and they need guys like Mark to uh, the Marks to uh, uh, dictate that to them. So back to uh, content moderation, right? Uh, this kind of neo-colonialism is is deeply embedded in this practice, and this is a map I found of. Uh, shipping routes from the 1920s. You can see California to the Philippines here. Um, if we were to map undersea cables against these shipping lanes, right? Or if we were to map um, the, uh, the movement of goods, the logistics-driven movement of goods around the globe, we'd start having some overlap and some overlays of these things, right? And these, the, the data that move in, around the world from the United States to the Philippines, for example, which is a major center of content moderation work offshored into third parties, uh, it's, it's in large part, it's, it's unidirectional. It's going to the Philippines. The Philippines isn't in a position to equally contribute back. In fact, the Philippines is, is an outpost for this kind of work in, in many of the same ways and for many of the same reasons that India has been. Remember, outsourced to Iowa, not India? And the reason is, is because uh, as some of the ad copy I've seen for, uh, for outsourcing firms that are soliciting this type of work from the Philippines, Filipino people have an excellent command of American vernacular in English, as if that just happened by accident, right? Um, but it didn't. It didn't because the Philippines was uh, a colony of the United States for 100 years. 
And even after it regained independence, we could argue that it had militaristic and economic uh, domination foisted upon it by the United States. In fact, if we look at a picture here, this is of a place called Bonifacio Global City, um, BGC, if you know Manila. This, Manila has a lot of like really hyper-developed areas, has shopping, high-end um, uh, dining, high-end uh, housing, and of course, in those skyscrapers, that is where you will find outsourcing firms. Now, this is a particularly interesting place in Manila because this used to be called Fort McKinley, and this is where the United States Army uh, operated its, uh, its, its colonial occupation of the Philippines, and later this became a, a, a Filipino military base. Okay, so all of that having been said, where does that leave us? Because that's a pretty ble bleak picture, I won't, I won't lie. Um, after the, the incident with, with Elon and you know, his space race and wanting to end content moderation and he finally did buy the company, of course I quit and I went back to UCLA where I belong because I don't belong in a tech company, I've come to learn, uh, even if the work there is good and, and it can help people. I realized as I watched the, the flame out of Twitter that of course everyone predicted and very quickly occurred the invitation, the direct invitation to people who had been deplatformed for all kinds of good reasons, including Donald Trump, who fomented an insurrection on Twitter, using Twitter, to be invited back. The, the rescinding of rules that protected, for example, trans people, uh, the increase in harassment and violence towards people on Twitter, and Elon's comments themselves. This all happened very, very quickly, and this new kind of um, uh, hostile, cruel culture became the norm, even if that existed on Twitter before, which of course it did. It became the norm, and it, became, uh, from, it came from the top down. And I started asking myself how I had so <laughs> grievously erred to have believed that there was something intrinsically different about Twitter that made it okay for me to be so engaged with it as a user and ultimately working there. And I realized that the kind of, uh, sh the, kind of uh, the nature of the, uh, of the shoot, even though it was so dramatic and so public and so quick, um, was really the kind of thing that was happening every day on every social media platform. They're just savvy enough to not do it in, out in front of everyone, right? But this kind of, these kinds of trade-offs on who matters and who gets to count, I mean, it really does come down to economics and it really does come down to, to profit, especially for firms that, uh, that have shareholders. But all of the, you know, the private companies need to turn a buck too. And so I realized that I had to, uh, I had to really kind of look inside myself and, and ask myself where I had gone wrong in my own cognitive dissonance around this. Now, at this time, Mastodon was gaining a lot of attention. And I started using it, and I missed Twitter, and I missed all my people on Twitter, and I missed the way that we engaged, and I missed it. Uh, a lot of things about it. You know, I was stumbling around on my Mastodon at first. I wasn't sure what I was doing. There was, it was not a friction-free experience. And then I realized that, of course, friction-free, just like cloud computing is someone else's computer, right? It's just someone else's computer. Friction-free is just the displacement of pain somewhere else, right? So my friction-free experience comes at a cost, and it comes at a cost of things like the horrible job of content moderation, for example, or Colton mining, or manufacturing in bad conditions, or the production of e-waste. And uh, I really, I went through sort of a, uh, yeah, sort of like a, a personal crisis about it. But I came out on the other end thinking that all is not lost. I'm, I, I'm actually, I refuse to cede computing and the internet and these means, these, in, you know, ingenious means of creating and doing and connecting. I, I just, I, I will not seed it wholly and throw up my hands. I, I think I will keep trying to uh, suggest that there are other ways until I'm dead. Because there are other ways. The thing is, is that these firms are in the business of telling us there aren't. That we lack imagination, that we lack skill, that we could never be uh, computer wizards enough to create and develop or operate 
these kinds of uh, these kinds of tools or platforms or services. And I say that that is total baloney. We can do that. We have done it. We should do it. We should do it on behalf of our communities. We should do it on behalf of our affinity groups. We should do it on behalf of ourselves. And uh, we should wrest some of that power back. So what I'm really saying is we need to seize the means of production on the internet. We, we, have not, we, have, we have seeded that, and it has been taken in a lot of ways, too. Taken by things like, um, you know, where's my phone? Like this thing, where if I wanted to repair it, or enhance it, or jailbreak it, or do anything with it, no dice, right? I want a computer that I can open up and, and work on and uh, modify and change, and I wanna know how to do that, more importantly, or I wanna know people who know how to do that. Um, I wanna think about how I can repurpose and reuse those objects and not just throw them in the trash, which has created a global crisis in, in the environment. And the trash, of course, goes out of sight, out of mind, also traveling to places like the Philippines on barges, right? Uh, and so I, I will close by telling you that uh, a little story, one more little story from when I was a kid. Uh, this was in the, this was in pretty much like 1980 is when I think this, the first time I attended this was. But my mom was a single mom. She worked at the university uh, and was also trying to finish up her bachelor's degree at this time. And so in the summer when I didn't have school, she had to stick me somewhere. And it had to be affordable and it had to be educational. You know, she didn't just want to plop me down in, in front of the, uh, in front of cartoons or whatever. And uh, in 1980, the uh, Department of Computer Science at the University of Wisconsin decided to offer a summer camp for kids. Now, I didn't know anything about computers. I didn't even know there, that that was a thing that existed. You know, it was 1980, and those things were pretty out of reach. And yet, I found myself in this computer camp, learning how to program with Logo, um, playing with uh, pretty primitive but cool robots, and doing other kinds of things that empowered me. Right? Especially as a little girl, like how else, how else was I going to get in the computer science department at that time, right? And I remember this really pivotal and, and powerful experience where a person came to visit us from the local community who had a business, and he was a, a man who was blind, and his business was called Computers to Help People. And he was working in 1980 on assistive and adaptive computing from the start thinking about how these tools could enhance the lives of people with disabilities of all sorts. In his case, um, he was blind, but he was thinking about people coming from all kinds of uh, places and how we might use the technology to give them a better life or to help them do things or to just be accessible to them. And I think about that a lot because computers to help people it, it, the name of the company, it just said what it was about. And it said also to me what could be, what the potential is for, for computing. And somewhere we lost that. Now it's computers to make us rich. Computers to, I mean, it's always been this to a certain extent, but computers, you know, for ballistics. <laughs> Computer, AI for military. Um, is it realistic that we're going to completely undo that? I mean, can we undo capitalism? Not, not today but we can certainly think about ways to intervene under these systems. And I wanna just propose to everyone to think about in your own lives, how could computers help people instead of enrich and harm them? And I'll leave it there, thank you.
Sarah, that was amazing. Thank you. Wow. You survived Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have to get together, and I'll, I'll have to tell you how I survived the film industry. Oh, I mean, okay. Our s stories are very similar. <laughs> um, thanks to everybody for coming, and thank you to Marisa, wherever she is. And thank you, Andrew, for inviting me, for sure. Um, I'm uh, Tom Leeser, I'm the director of the Center for Integrated Media and the director of uh, Program in Art and Technology at CalArts. Uh, my talk is a little different from Sarah's, but there's a lot of resonance uh, in the things that Sarah brought up and things that I've been thinking about a lot um, for quite some time. I love the map uh, of the shipping lanes, uh, partly because I've used that in my own lectures, and uh, what I do is I lay uh, the Facebook map over it and realize that we really don't live in a post-colonial world. So thank you for that. That was really great. Um, I also... So my students who are here uh, know that I don't usually do this. I don't usually read from a script. But I took this opportunity because I'm thinking about you know, expanding something into a more, um, a more specific piece of text. So I'm, I'm testing it out on you guys. You, you, you're my focus group, or my unfocused group, maybe. So, um, so I'm going to read. Um, and of course, there's, there will be a visual accompaniment, so don't worry. Um, I'm also, uh, I just always do this just to sort of get myself off the hook. You know, I, I have to qualify my, uh, my profession. I'm, I'm not an academic. Um, I'm an artist that finds himself in an academic environment, so I can do the choreography, but you really, that's not, you know, that's not my calling. And I don't do it to diss academics. What I'm doing is I'm, I have an enormous amount of respect for that profession and enormous amount of respect uh, for all the work that they do and all the research that they do. Uh, so um, it's an incredibly important um, profession that I want to reach out to and just say, Thank you for inviting me <laughs> to talk. Um, you know, and, and, and also because I'm involved in a lot of interdisciplinary practice, there's all sorts of correspondence and eavesdropping and all sorts of sharing and stealing. Um, so uh, this also is something that um, I like to characterize my, my, my calling for is, which is not to be sort of pinned down. And I think um, a lot about um, Walter Benjamin uh, when he uh, wrote that he uh, wants to write without being a writer. And, and, I, and I thought, whoa, okay. So I want to make art without being an artist. And I think we're really at that critical moment where the things that we have adopted or taken from the 20th century are no longer really uh, workable. And that we tend to look to the past to, to uh, validate the present. And then of course, from a political con context, we tend to incorporate notions of the future because without notions of the future, uh, we would never be able to sort of figure things out, right? We have to sort of imagine uh, the, the future. Uh, but it's a very much of a very much of a Marxist kind of position to dwell on the future and to uh, find oneself creating um, strategies and language uh, that to accommodate futures. So um, it's a little preamble. So, ready? Fasten your seatbelts. In the artist Jack Whitten's book, 
notes from the woodshed. He states that a painting cannot be painted. It must be made to make as an event that takes place in space-time. He has a list of 32 objectives, and number 30 reads, use science as a metaphor. And as we all know through experience in this current technological and carnivalesque moment, all making, in particular art making, uh, is in a state of amplified drift, where dissent has become complicated by dissonance, where science is considered heresy and books are being banned again. I'm delivering my talk from this turbulent and inverted, untimed perspective, excerpts from my commonplace book, my ongoing indisciplinary review of techno-culture, metaphor and metonym, and the knot that binds subject and object. The form of the talk also references the artist uh, Adam Pendleton. His quote found in Paper Monument's book, Social Medium Artists Writing 2000 to 2015, goes like this. <clears throat> I've always thought of language as an image-making device and image as a language-making device. So this talk is a collaborative act, a choreographic moment with you, the audience, and me in a language of collective conjuring. Being a visual thinker and an artist, let the words function as an image-making device, raw data for us to visualize something new outside of any and all binary boundaries. Welcome, Gert Loving, by the way. Uh, after reading uh, Loving's book, Stuck on the Platform, I was drawn to the use of the word platform in the title. Also, what does it mean to be stuck? Stuck as not moving, static, like a tombstone or a monument? What does it mean to be on the platform, not in or under, not part or maybe connected to? Indeterminately and or inevitably. So consider this a response to a closed code platform futures written as both verse and prose derived from an inverse describing. A forensic scraping and scrapping of the archive to help us diagnose the problem at hand. The interconnected and entangled kinships of subject and object are examined in a space that I'm calling the underconscious a hidden space conjoined within the digital domain residing just below the surface of our day-to-day -day awareness between somewhere and nowhere. With similarities to aesthetic consciousness, but mo with more nuance and complications. Our perceptions and cognition recomposed, fragmentary, subjective experiences converted objects that remain out of sight, in the shadows, then out of the underconscious they emerge in our user UX as effect. Affect, sorry. So let's, uh, our, let's ask ourselves a question. What happens when the user's underconscious and the platform can be seen both as the subject and the object simultaneously? I owe a debt of gratitude to my colleague, Joel Skeynes, and his extensive writing and research on metaphor and metonym. Charles tells us, the cause and effect of the temporal space of the indexical sign is disrupted as the subject object occupy a shared space. What we have is a highlighting of a spatial structure that gives rise to concepts rather than focus being on the concepts themselves. And when we consider the platform as an object, a metaphoric architecture entangled with our subjective experience, within a spatial structure. Within this spatial structure, we can examine subject and object as the constituent parts, a composite that requires us to dissect the correlations and, <clears throat> and their dynamic interactions. 
From here, we can launch our search for the platform's origin story and its subsequent trajectory. Not on the platform's embedded concepts, but rather on the concepts that arise from our investigation of the word and its metaphoric use in digital culture. As it applies to our contemporary and historical experiences, relative within a textual and temporal framing, recognizing and responding to the conditions of power. It is unapologetically commercial. Oops. <laughs> it's so funny. Oh, yeah, well, whatever. It's paper. OK. <laughs> OK, here we go. Um, the platform metaphor is inaccurate, as all metaphors are. The tech industry has employed the word platform uh, as a metaphor to function as a neutral transmitter and pacifier, sold to us as an enabler and identifier of social and creative expression, rendered as an automatic subject and as uh, an invisible data product. These words are also a byproduct of surveillance capitalism, contextualized by the torrent of clickbait deployed by our lesser angels that feed off our addictive impulses. By way of Merriam-Webster, here is an abbreviated list of definitions for platform. A flat, horizontal surface that is usually higher than the adjoining area, such as a stage or a dais, like where I'm standing. A declaration of principles on which a person stands, like the ones I'm transmitting. A means or opportunity to communicate ideas or information to a group of people like you. A usually thick layer between the inner sole and outer sole of a shoe. I'm sure we get the references to the first three definitions, but it's this last definition that I'm drawn to, probably because of my affinity with the absurd. The description of the thick layer between the inner sole and the outer sole of a shoe caused a flashback in my mind to a recent experience I had seeing Virgil uh, Abloh's exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum. Prior to experiencing the exhibit, I'll admit to a certain amount of skepticism about the work, but in retrospect, I was taken by Abloh's unbridled, indisciplinary methods in establishing a cogent and definitive critique through a hybrid synthesis of art and fashion. His sneakers use the platform as an empowering catalyst that plays out in possible worlds. Abloh's shoe is a rendered object that intertwines the political and the poetic. Double meanings give rise to one's awareness of the performative body supplanting the ordinary surface, floating above the street to a higher goal of empowerment. His shoes become a stage and gives a rise to a statement, a declaration of principles, and a means to deliver its representation as both subject and object, mirroring the gain's example. It is unapologetically commercial, mass-produced, and yet capable of shape-shifting, transforming its appearance like a spectral ready-made. This is not just an ordinary fashion statement. Abloh's platform sneaker becomes a multilingual mechanism for resistance, difference, and identity through an uncommon space-time. However, it doesn't announce its intention directly. It's written in code, a message haunted within layers of meanings. Tricksters puzzle, meant to confront and confound the dominant culture. It is slang that shifts to structure through an adoption of paradox. It operates within and without the confines of cap capitalism. His platform is both a thing and not a thing, both metaphor and metonym. Unlike Abloh's sneakers, the digital platform has shifted over time outside of its original intent, which is well described by Sarah's talk just now. The shift is a top-down corporate maneuver. It started out as a stage, a forum, a space for the delivery of principles through various renditions of social organizing, community activism, and tactical media. But now it predominantly functions as a corporate holodeck stimulating and simulating our underconscious while monetizing our searches, uploads, DMs, and stories through successive data reaping. In Tiziana Terranova's book, After the Internet, 
She reports on the platform as the corporate um, platform complex, the CPC. She alerts us to the earlier iterations of the internet that have been subsumed. They exist as being undead, lurking in the shadows of the CPC. The progressive optimism of the 1990s internet is retained only as a muted ghostly presence in the form of past potentials of political and cultural change. The subject in this critique has been devoured by the object. Platform culture has mutated to become vampire culture. The current and repetitive and cyclical state of affairs with its biases, conspiracy theories, and insidious bots rising up to the night and trapping us, the compliant users, and then feeding off of our data, the vampire returns to its tomb to transmogrify the ensnared cost per click information, digesting it as its new source of value. And this leads the user to wander and roam in real life in search for the next trending influencer and the next killer app. The underconscious that I'm referring to is both knowing and unknowing existing beneath the surface of our senses. It is an internalized space time and dream time actualized in screen time. It too is paradoxical, a non-dual merging of our online and offline activities and perceptions. If the underconscious goes unnoticed, it causes us to experience our fractured reflections within the screen, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I don't usually do this, you know, it's like, I, I, you know, usually I'm just talking, I'm, you know, I'm showing images, I'm getting through this, you know, and whatever. Where was I? Okay. Uh, the underconscious can be helpful and generative, but it can also inhibit and manifest as a zone of conflict while we venture away from the keyboard and the func as functional synambulances uh, uh, in an AFK world. So the underconsciousness is kept under wraps, a psychogenic depository for our durational desires and anxieties. It is there, but not there. Its presence is a, phant is a, is a phantasm from the hauntological archive manifesting as whispers, murmurs, and echoes and rumors. Feeding our hungry ghosts with a subcurrent of nonstop replays, it's an age of, dis of diminished discontent. An age where our retired and unemployed gods have been outsourced to our machines, who in turn have depleted their supply of loving grace. The altered states we crave have become entangled with the real, as the digital ritual can't stop, won't stop. It does not travel in one time. Its duration is both internal and external, modular and, inde and indeterminate. Similar to, non -terminating, to a non-terminating script of infinite loops, the result is a reflexive anxiety underwritten by hypercapitalism psychic material fused with our biology and delivered as a virtual neurotoxin to our brain, producing a second nervous system, a confused artificial body with artificial intelligence and artificial intimacy. So we wait, anxiously, bringing on the platform's ongoing notifications disguised as sensational patterns of ecstasy and empathy. Then the dopamine kicks in. It stimulates our grasping for status, and our hunger for self-identification and self-confirmation. Likes and followers are mined for gratification and validation. At this point, I'd like to summon Mamiwara. And when needed, Mamiwara, the African water deity, will surface. She too comes up to our world from our underconscious to warn us at times. She'll drag us down to her subterranean realm. She'll sit us down to give us a stern talking to, and she reminds us to be aware about what we put into our bodies and minds, but she's worried about what we do with the stuff that comes out. However benevol uh, benevolent our gin is, her contract only allows her to provide temporary relief. We quickly go back to our craving, answering and absorbing the platform's delivery of relentless streams. 
We adopt the platform's language of disaster and doom, ingesting the metaphor over and over until we lose sight of any indexical reference. We interact and identify with our filtered personas and influencing avatars, unaware we indulge in its artificial nature and fabricated projections. However, if, uh, however, if we take heed of Mamiwata and her analysis, we can resurface and then we can recognize the corporate platform complex as our personal and collective Pompeii. But whose apocalypse is this? Where is the apocalypse and when is the apocalypse? Anticipating the inevitable silence, we cringe at the ruins of our economic and environmental crises, dropping ourselves in the gap between brilliance and unbalanced. We have colonized ourselves and we have become our own fiction. We have merged with our posts and we have all agreed to surveil ourselves. Our walls and fences need no guards. We gladly promenade with, within the status of a delusionary self, a self that neither exists nor doesn't exist, a, a conjoined subject and object sold to us as a nanosecond avant-garde trending within a condition of fear, a fear of missing out. Our need to know our personal liberation should start with acknowledging that the platform does not exist. It only appears to us as a virtual machine, a mirage. The catalyst for a new model must come with, uh, from the recognition and remi uh, reminder that decolonization is not a metaphor. The subject object needs to come into focus so we can see its dependent origination, its aggregates and its bundles. The antidote has to start with a progressive strategy that reveals the unseen aspects of the underconscious and removes our habitual tendencies. A flattening of the platform and the dispelling of capital intensive hierarchies and their credit and interest economies, both corporate and institutional. My guide for rethinking the platform metaphor and the study of the underconscious has been assisted by the spirits of Fred Moten and Stefano Harney after reading their well known book from a few years back, The Undercommons. In their book, they describe the idea of the subjective, um, sorry, in, in their book, they describe the idea of the subject this way. For capital, the subject has become too cumbersome, too slow, so prone to terror, too controlling to say nothing of too rarefied, too specialized a form of life. This fantasy of what Marx called the automatic subject, this fantasy that capital could exist without labor, is nothing new, but is continually, ex continually explored at the nexus of finance capital, logistics, and the terror of state-sponsored personhood, which instanti instantiated in various pageants of conferral and withholding. The internal outside, the unassimilated underground, beyond the beyond. Moten Harney's critique of capital, capital without labor, the state definition of personhood, the social transformed into the digital commodity, value as an automatic subject, not an interconnected global marketplace, but a series of parallel worlds. The platform as an automated bazaar takes, us re takes up residence in our underconscious by exploiting and then seducing. An expansion of the present progressive discourse needs to take place, focusing on alternate structural revaluations if we want to reconfigure the platform and our psyches beyond the inaccurate metaphors of neutrality and beyond control and submission. Lovink advocates in his book, rethinking networks as tools to create new beginnings and to push aside the never-ending obsession with the finality of this world. I'm supportive of Loving's premise, his call for rethinking the network, adopting real self-organization, pursuing legitimate intimacy and new zones of temporality. These are not deliverables that will come from finance capital and the tech sector. A new clarion of subject and object has to be performed simultaneously. The platform needs to be seen for what it is, raw information technology within a critically indifferent but biased political and aesthetic process. 
It functions as a surplus commodity that assumes the identity of vampire through attachment and accumulations. To create new beginnings, as Loving suggests, it will require us to restructure models of time, past and future, along the lines of Berardi's non-abiding infinite present, to engage in archaic revivals and to be unabashedly anachronistic. At the same time, to have the foresight to act upon what Legacy Russell describes in her book, Glitch Feminism. She reminds us to identify that we have agency to consent or refuse our current relationship status. Too often we forget that we have the right to leave if we want to. We have the right to deny our use and through this close the wounds created by a world fed on binary rhetoric. The collapse of the gap between offline and online and the dissolving of the dichotomy between subject and object does not simply imply the singularity or false uniformity. Rather, it is a way to understand that a new commons is facilitated and constructed through an updated intraactive pairing of the technical and the political. It is best described as a non-dual relationship, a new network based on real societal and cultural exchange, rather than one that is simply built on transactional natures. This restructuring includes language and alternative ways of becoming. We need to transform the spatial structures into a non-binary play space that is liberating, diverse, and joyful. A play space that is configured around event and action, a synthesis of online and offline initiatives. Power for this new beginning needs to be reconfigured and taken, not by building corporate metaverses, but assisted by new progressively active and mobile information and aesthetic systems. And these systems need to be scalable and agile to given environments, cultures, and situations. A revised understanding of what it means to be a collective is in order outside of surplus and more in line with equity and pluralism. As David Graeber and David Wengro wrote in their book, Dawn of Everything, <clears throat> they state that surplus is a concept that poses a funda fundamental questions about what it means to be human. Patrick Jagoda explains in his book, Network Aesthetics, that the term network is too ubiquitous today. He states that the, word is, the word's ubiquity has made it a cliche, a concept at once recognizable, but yet hard to explain. Platform suffers <clears throat> from the same ailment. We can start by moving away from corporate digital metaphors that index things that they are not. New language is needed to articulate the set of relations and processes that expose the actual intent and motives of platform capitalism and can express alternative modes of artistic response. Here it is. Uh, artificial, artificial intelligence, AI, is, a prob is also a problematic metaphor. It's been used to camouflage a mindless technical process of exhuming language from the internet and predicting the most likely grammatical patterns. Through statistical analysis, whose output only looks and sounds human. Tim uh, Gebru, a former Google technical co-lead of the ethical artificial intelligence team and the current executive director of the Distributed Artificial Intelligence Research Institute, DAIR, is one of the many recent activist writers to warn us of the inherent biases found in corporate technology systems and their algorithms. In a recent Washington Post opinion piece, which is owned by Amazon, she spoke to the controversy around sentience in AI. She says, the seductiveness of bots that simulate human consciousness can distract from the real problems inherent in AI projects. When referencing uh, LLMs, lang large language models, she uses the metaphor stochastic parrots. She says LLMs generate 
seemingly coherent text that can lead people to, into perceiving a quote unquote mind when what they're really seeing is pattern matching. This speaks directly to Moten and Harney's concern with state definitions of personhood, except in Google's case, it gives automation, robotics, and the algorithm outputs of platform capitalism a corporate definition of personhood, a reverse metaphor with the ability to monetize what it produces as human intelligence and sentience. By awarding sentience to AI in this way, Gerber highlights another problem describing AI as a human function, implying that, quote, any wrongdoing is the work of an independent being rather than the company itself made up of real people and their decisions and subject to regulation that created it. <laughs> Stanford professor and futurist forecaster Paul Sappho writes that we first invent our technologies and then we turn around and use the technologies to reinvent ourselves as individuals, as communities, and ultimately as entire cultures. This machine is body, body as machine metaphor should be a concern since it sets us up in an anthropomorphic escape hatch, allowing the CPC to divert liability and culpability, but not when the system crashes, but when. We are at the crossroads, a critical time of reinvention, not only for the issues surrounding technology and platforms, but also our real human relationships to the climate, the planet, and ever increasing biological extinctions. This crisis is not just cultural, it's ontological. It's an international crisis being powered and funded by retrograde tacticians and think tanks. This is the thing to be negated. Coded rhetoric delivered as cardboard conceptualism, digital pyramid schemes, and crypto grifters who impact the environment with energy hogging data centers that exceed the consumptions of many nations. Imaginary borders fortified by walls made of shipping containers whose ironic symbolism seems to be lost on the architects. Border policies being used to turn away people trying to seek asylum from violence, authoritarianism, and labor exploitation, the exact consequences of capitalism itself. The walls and fortifications are both geographic and corporeal, a reconstructed nativism that leaks into our underconscious. The platform's strategy is to mollify its opposition by constant diversions of spectacle within the White Lotus Resort. Please, no more Negronis, I've had enough. <laughs> we are invited to escape to Cameron's world of water momentarily, to self-identify with his avatars, to swim in an imaginary space of forgetting, leaving our physical bodies in the virus for the warm glow of a screen. Virtual unrealities that are choreographed to the tune of fabricated and acritical meta-immersions. Tech industry billionaires will not save us. They're locked away in their bunkers. After the countdown, they'll blast off, next stop Mars, and future colonized planets. The eternal return, it's 1493 all over again. As they zoom away to build uh, uh, re reconstituted empires built on the memories of previous enslaved and exploited bodies, surplus consumption and our data will be their fuel yet again. As our counteracting strategy, our new beginnings can heed Leotard's words. Stay put, but quietly seize every chance to function as good intensity conducting bodies. And to return back to painting, I'll end with this from Marvin Minsky, co-founder of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's AI Laboratory. Minsky is AI. He said, back in the day, the art of painting is not in any one idea, nor in a multitude of separate tricks for placing all those pigment spots, but in the great network of relationships among its parts. Similarly, the agents raw that make our minds are by themselves as valueless as aimless scattered daubs of paint. What counts is what we make of them. So who's working this way? 
And I'm gonna show some, a few slides of, of artists that I've worked with uh, over the past two years and also artists that you probably know, but I wanted to put the art practice within this context of critique so that we can see that the process of shifting and changing, being at the moment of crossroads is uh, an, not an emergent practice, but a practice that actually artists are, 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 are involved in directly. And this is Rashid Newsom's uh, slide from Rashid Newsom, his piece that he did in, uh, at the Armory recently. Uh, and the interesting thing about this immersive space, uh, it, involves <coughs> it involves avatars, it involves VR and AR, uh, well not VR, sorry, uh, AR. But what he also did was he used the space as an educational space as a workshop environment where he brought the community in to discuss issues around identity, issues around choreography, issues around gender, and issues around queerness. And so the work itself became an institution for a short period of time. So this blending of institutional activity within a, a creative practice within an arts environment is something that I'm looking at um, closely. And Rashid is a really good example of this. Um, Another artist I've worked with recently is Sandra Perry, and Sandra's work deals directly with questions around identity and technology in relationship to the body, and specifically in relationship to the black body and the black female identified body. And the notion of what, what is acceptable or what is understood as being uh, a body that one should attain to. And given this use of the, well, in this, in this image, uh, there's not a, a, an exercise um, device. In, an, in a, another project that she did, she actually had an exercise device be the, um, the uh, holder of the, of the monitors. But what happens within the monitors in her work is that she morphs her identity through uh, the construction of an avatar. And over time, the identity changes to a point where it becomes abstract. So this notion of abstraction and representation coexisting within a condition of change has a lot to do with what I'm trying to get at in relationship to defining this period of awareness that is just below the surface of, of everyday existence, right? So it's the things that, how we relate to the screen, how we relate to the object, we end up going into this almost curious state of dreaming where the object, the data, and our bodies merge in terms of what Gaines is talking about in relationship to the collapse of the subject object. And then um, Maya Lin's uh, uh, piece at, um, in New York at <clears throat> Madison Square just recently um, where she, uh, it's called Ghost Forest, where she took trees that had been uh, affected by the environment and, and killed and replanted them uh, in the park themselves. And they became this, this character of witness, a really incredibly powerful character of witness, where the actual object itself transcended its representation to the point where it then too also was able to collapse notions of affect and concept into a res political response. And then the work of um, uh, forensic architecture uh, is really uh, important. And of course, there was uh, issues around documenta, et cetera. But the work that they're doing uh, specifically uh, relates to this idea of educative initiative that utilizes the internet doesn't <clears throat> utilize the internet almost to the point where it, I, I, I'm sh I would su suggest, because just because Garrett's here, wouldn't suggest it, but I'll say it anyway. Um, I think we all owe a debt to Garrett in how he started Net Time in relationship to thinking about tactile media, specifically, again, in this notion of collapse of the aesthetic and the political. And I think. Forensic architecture has a lot to be, uh, is very much in debt to a lot of what uh, Ger uh, initiated from the 1990s. And 
Yeah, so you could, you could read about their uh, practice also online. That's all I got. Can everyone hear? Oh, yep, okay. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Olivia Snow. Um, I am a writer, a researcher at uh, Center for Critical Internet Inquiry, and a dominatrix, which is very relevant to my talk, <laughs> which um, is on platform safety for sex workers. Um, which, <laughs> you know, it was funny. I, um, I was going through, hold on. Okay. I was going through the program this morning and noted that the first sentence says, if Twitter is the canary in the coal mine, and I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> like, excuse me, um, sex workers uh, on the internet uh, specifically are regularly understood as the canary in the coal mine for, uh, for tech surveillance and state violence. Um, so I, I'm still trying to wrap my brain around, like, how is Twitter even a canary? That doesn't make sense. It's a terrible... Apologies to <laughs> copywriters. Um, but, uh, you know, sex workers have a lot to teach um, researchers about safety online in ways that I think uh, are often overlooked, because this is a type of labor that people don't want to think about um, and don't want to be associated with and just kind of want to you know, sequester away. So I, um, I'm i also gonna start with a story. Um, I kind of call it my, my villain origin story um, to explain how I got into this work. Because, um, you know, researching sex work was never, excuse me, something that um, I planned to do as an academic. Um, I got my PhD about five years ago in 19th century American literature, a very lucrative field um, that, nonetheless, um, <laughs> led me uh, into a bit of a financial snafu one summer, about a year after I defended my dissertation. Um, and you know, thinking, I, I ended up in a position where I needed to raise something like $2,000 in a week to cover all my bills. It was like July 1st, I was like, shit, like, what? And you know, really the only reasonable solution that I could come to was either, you know, win the lottery or start doing sex work, right? Um, like, how else are you going to make that amount of money in that amount of time? You're not, period. <laughs> like, unless you, you know, have a, a safety net where you already have access to that money. Um, and sex work was something that I had done off and on in high school, college, graduate school, just to make ends meet. It had been a while since I did it, but whatever. Um, so, you know, I immediately start hustling. <laughs> I'm able to get my rent. Um, I... I find myself back in a dungeon, working as a dominatrix, um, a dungeon being the term for like a BDSM brothel almost. Um, and you know, at that point I, and I wasn't doing online sex work, you know, and OnlyFans was not then what it is now, this was before the pandemic. Um, but you know, being in a dungeon, in a commercial dungeon, if you have not worked as a dominatrix personally, um, you know, you need to set up a profile so that potential clients can go and you know review you, look at you, figure out what your interests are, if you vibe, whatever. Um, so I started thinking about online safety because, of course, these profiles are online. Like, you know, how else are they going to find them uh, in 2019? And you know, for me, um, and I think. Both uh, Sarah and Tom's excellent talks kind of touched on this, but the, uh, the there's um, you know the slippage between internet life and like IRL life and this kind of misconception that they're in any way separate. Um, so you know I think at at first blush, one might conclude that uh, 
doing sex work in person, for instance, is a lot more dangerous than OnlyFans or content creation or making porn. Um, but you know, the way I saw it was I'm, you know, I'm still on the job market as an American lit person. I don't need um, one of my students, for instance, to be looking up the local dungeon and seeing like, oh, <laughs> that's my teacher. You know, I didn't need those images reproduced and disseminated to people who would use them against me. Um, so for me, my physical safety even um, was far more dependent on online safety, if that makes sense, than like my actual physical or yeah, my actual physical behaviors. So, you know, I made sure I didn't show my face, I didn't show my tattoos, which did, you know, negatively impact my income, but it was fine, whatever. Um, and then one night, I'm on my way home, I was living in Brooklyn, and I'm on the subway uh, going through Facebook, and I see the people you may know section, if you remember that, um, and it's doxing my coworkers to me. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> like, I didn't, I, like, I didn't consent to have this information. Um, and, you know, we all, as workers together in the dungeon, um, like, we didn't want to know each other's real names. We didn't want to slip up by accident and call, call, you know, I didn't want to call Mistress Deliria, like, Jennifer by accident in the middle of, like, a double session, right? Um, so I'm getting this information I don't want, and I realize, like, oh, of course, because our devices are in such close physical proximity to each other. Um, obviously, Facebook is going to figure that out. You know, we, we would have been sharing a Wi-Fi network if the owner ever paid the internet bill. But <laughs> um, and, you know, like a, a regular client was also likely to find this information if he or she were to go on to Facebook or whatever. Um, and like, I, I know I personally didn't even have like location services turned on, didn't matter. Um, and, you know, <laughs> About right after this happened, so so this this little journey began July 2019. So this is like you know mid August. Um, I am preparing to start back at school, right? Because I you know teach on the academic calendar. Um, start applying for tenure track jobs again. You know this was going to be like a summer, uh, you know just just kind of patching my income <laughs> until I I uh, till the semester started. Um, and I'm, <laughs> I, uh, I'm talking to one of my dissertation committee members that summer, uh, and she and I were like, we're pretty tight. We, we were really tight. We were, we were like thick as thieves. We talked a lot. Um, and she's asking me, she's like, hey, so you're going back to, um, to teaching in a few weeks. Are you applying for, you're applying for tenure track jobs? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, of course. And she goes, um, well, I know you weren't teaching this summer. Uh, what were you doing? And I was like, working? And <laughs> she's like, what? W work, working where? And I'm like, at my job. And <laughs> she's finally like, no, but where are you working? What are you doing? How have you been making money? So I tell her, I'm like, okay, well, I've been doing sex work this summer. Um, and, you know, I know that, that can't really get out, but I've taken these precautions to protect my safety, yada, yada, yada. Um, and she's like not having it. Really starts like icing me out, giving me the cold shoulder. Fine. A um, few weeks go by and, you know, uh, uh, applications are due for tenure track jobs. So one day I'm sitting in the lounge room uh, at CUNY where I teach and I had some time in between two of my classes, and I go into Interfolio, because I was putting, in Interfolio, if you don't know, is this dossier service that a lot of tenure track uh, job applications use. Um, and it, it stores you know, your writing sample, your CV, your, your, your teaching evaluations, your letters of recommendation. So I go to select these letters of rec. For most tenure track jobs, you need three letters. So I get the first two, and then I scroll down, and I see that she, this, this dissertation committee member, had deleted all of my letters without telling me. Um, not like it would have been better had she told me, but, <laughs> but this was not an ideal way to find out. Um, so, you know, at that point, she had more or less entirely 
restricted my access to uh, an academic life. Entirely just kind of cut that off. Um, and, you know, I think that, uh, well, I mean, first of all, um, <laughs> like, uh, how this relates to tech aside, I am really um, curious as to who would think, upon learning that the, like, writer and teacher they'd been training for a decade is a professional sadist, who's going to be like, oh, I'm going to take her letter away. I'm going to screw with her. Like, why would you come to that conclusion? Not very smart, um, <laughs> like, at all. So obviously, you know, I wrote about it, and it went viral, and now she's a husk of her former self. Um, <laughs> um, at that point, I, you know, couldn't really take literature seriously anymore. You know, I'm like, people are dying. Um, and then, you know, started researching, uh, and, you know, almost in an auto-ethnographic way, uh, sex work and tech. Um, so to get back to my point about um, this kind of misconception about the, uh, di about there being a difference between the online world and, like, the real world, um, which is something, like, I really, you know, I'll get told if I'm dealing with some nonsense on Twitter, like, oh, just log off. Like, that's not, I, 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 you know, I get the impulse, like, remove yourself from that situation, but, um, I mean, I think we can all agree, we might say, like, oh, okay, cyber harassment, like, you know, is, isn't violence, but, you know, there are a lot of uh, ways that the internet is really built to facilitate uh, in person violence. Um, and we see that, uh, you know, through the way that content moderators, for instance, are forced to traumatize themselves for um, a pittance. Um, but, you know, even beyond that, we understand, like, doxing, um, which is more often than not taken out of contents, context, uh, not to mean, you know, what it does, can, can absolutely facilitate physical violence. If you have someone's address, you can go to there. Um, and hurt them. Uh, we radicalization. Uh, you know the January. Si How many people died on January six? Which also, side note, happens to me my birthday. Worst birthday of my life. <laughs> like, but how many people died that day? You know this is, this is still the the real world. But I want to focus more on uh, what similar to what my my uh, dissertation committee member did. Uh, but restricting access to the public sphere, um, especially in an increasingly digitized world, um, is a type of violence that uh, happens quite frequently and you know, we don't really get to hear about because if you're restricted from the public sphere, then who can hear you? Who, how, uh, if you're just, if you vanished, no one's gonna hear you like from the grave. Um, so to uh, kind of historicize this a bit, um, how many of you know what FASA SESTA is? Oh, okay, so a third. Um, okay, so FASA SESTA is, it was this legislation in 2018. It's the, I think it's Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act and the Stop Enabling Sex, Trafficking Act. And like both of those things sound really good, right? Like sex trafficking bad, stopping it good. <laughs> like, um, but you know, of course, because this is American politics, uh, the acts had absolutely nothing to do with any uh, meaningful action against sex trafficking. It was primarily uh, legislation aimed to slice into Section 230. So uh, section, blah, 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 section 230 is um, this piece of legislation from I think the, uh, what, the, online, the Telecommunications Act of 96 um, that protects platforms from liability um, around what users choose to do on that platform. Um, so, you know, I, I think a good example is like if someone stabs you in Times Square, you're not going to sue Times Square, right? You're going to sue the guy who stabbed you. <laughs> um, so similar kind of uh, philosophy behind 230. But this uh, revised 230, Section 230, to 
make um, any use of the internet at all to facilitate prostitution a felony. <laughs> Note that prostitution is not sex trafficking. But, um, and of course, you know, it doesn't define prostitution, so it's really just, you know, anyone who's doing something unsavory we don't like. Um, and to, like, explain how uh, absolutely absurd this legislation is, it was just in the D.C. Circuit Court, I think, last week. Uh, and, uh, it, the issue was, are libraries uh, liable for felony sex trafficking if they allow users of library computers to uh, talk about decriminalization of sex work. Like, that's ridiculous. Um, other similarly ridiculous examples are, say I take an Uber to a session. Um, now that Uber driver is liable for sex trafficking. <laughs> like, if uh, DoorDash delivers me food in the middle of, like, a long day of work, now the DoorDash guy is liable for a felony. It's absurd, right? But, I mean, the point of the bill, and there were multiple points of the bill, um, the bills, but really, when I'd say when you come down to it, it's that sex workers are a safety threat. And proximity to sex workers are a safety threat. So when you ask, or when one asks, uh, you know, how do we make platforms intersectional and safer? Um, why, you know, how, how do we make these platforms safer for, for things that are inherently safety threats? You know, to make Twitter, for example, safer, to make actually Twitter is the only major social media platform that allows sex workers, period, like at all. Um, because to make Instagram, for instance, safer, it banned sex workers. And not, and you know, not just like illegal, not just sex trafficking, but you know, legal strippers, legal domination. Um, it really, you know, this doesn't have anything to do with the law, it's about power, right? Um, uh, and it's about, further maligning this demographic um, in a way that what they do to us, you won't get to hear about. And if you do hear it, you're not gonna care, or you're not gonna believe it, or you're gonna think, well, good riddance. You know, um, another example of this, unrelated to FASA Sessa, uh, um, have y'all followed the, uh, there are these ident identification laws where you need to provide your driver's license and not even like a state ID, it has to be a driver's license. So like you have to learn how to drive to access porn, um, but you have to provide your driver's license to access Pornhub in Louisiana, Alabama, and I think Utah um, just passed the same legislation. And uh, the way that, um, that states and legislators are able to use public funding for this type of uh, action or projects is by categorizing porn as a public health hazard, um, like legally, which you know is also just fascinating in the middle of a pandemic. Um, like, does anyone else remember in the beginning of 2020 when, like, I know New York City did this a lot. They actually had like guides, like stay safe masturbate at home like it was really <laughs> um, like because and you know a lot of like myself included in-person sex workers were like well our our income stream is totally sh uh like just has just been removed from us sex workers specifically were excluded from getting any uh government assistance uh so you know most uh pivoted to only fans um uh, I did not because of <laughs> the reasons I outlined earlier. Um, but, uh, okay. Um, so to get back, I guess, to, uh, here, hold on. I can't read my own writing to save my life, by the way. Also, like, I didn't make a PowerPoint because I hate PowerPoint. I don't know why I hate PowerPoint, but I know I do, like, a lot. So <laughs> I just like, don't have one. Um, where am I? Okay, so I guess, um, right. Okay. Um, 
FOSTA SESTA. So the way the FOSTA SESTA uh, functioned um, practically was, you know, it's actually only been uh, used, or I, someone's only been charged with it one time ever. Um, but what it primarily did was kind of green light to platforms that they were, that sex workers were essentially a free for all, that they can experiment on us and our visibility, that they can test drive new products, that they can do whatever they want to us, and there is nothing we can do about it because they are protected by law and we are not. Uh, we are a liability to them and they are, you know, fully able to do whatever they want with us. Um, and again, you know, there's no recourse because e even if people hear us, which they won't, no one cares. Um, so, you know, I wanna talk a, a, a bit about uh, the kind of violence that is enacted when, um, when you're trying to stay safe as a safety threat. Um, and you know, I think these these are all things that we understand in the abstract to be violent, um, but really don't think about in most in many cases how how that will lead. You know, it's it, it's ideologically violent, but no, this is physical violence too. So I'm thinking um, uh, search engines, for instance, um, and this one's a little less related to the process and more violence in general, but. Um, or I guess rather doxing. Um, so say, you know, I've been doxed a few times um, on Twitter, and uh, because um, because in part uh, of FOSTA SESTA and just Twitter's like laissez-faire attitude towards sex workers, um, their doxing policy specifically excludes things that sex workers. Uh, will occlude for our own safety. So, you know, government name, workplace, birth date. Um, you know, I didn't even tell people what my PhD was in until I got doxxed for like the 50th time, and I was like, it doesn't matter anymore. Um, so if someone doxes you on, say, Twitter, that's not gonna be a violation of terms and services because they can't uh, admit to having sex workers on the platform um, otherwise, that puts them at a liability for facilitating sex trafficking, right? So you can't get that down. And then Google crawls that. So let's say you happen to be, I don't know, an adjunct professor who works as a dominatrix on the side, and your uh, students are trying to find your Rate My Professors, and what they find instead are, you know, your ad photos that you were using for clients under your pseudonym. Let's say it's something like, I don't know, Snow. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, there, there's no recourse whatsoever here. And then if we want to take that a step further, which, you know, I have to do, um, let's say, let's say you happen to have a stalker or seven and, you know, they're Googling your, your pseudonym. They find your real name. Fine. Um, keep searching for that. Find out I teach at CUNY. Okay. Then, because it's a public institution, they find out what I'm teaching. They find out when I'm teaching it. They find out what building it's in. And then they're able to be in that you know, location when they know I will be as well, right? Like that's a level kind of past, you know, this isn't about like the shame of being a sex worker or something like, oh no, they'll find out. Um, but you know, a real physical threat. Um, another, uh, Jesus, my handwriting's awful. Um, Deplatforming. So I don't know if any of you have ever been kicked off of social media for any reason. Like I know I got kicked off of Facebook for like, <laughs> I think I threatened one of my like mother's Trump supporting coworkers with some form of violence and they just threw me off. Um, but sex workers quite regularly get, get our accounts suspended just out of nowhere. Um, you know, one example I like is my, my, I've had I think three TikTok accounts suspended. I've never actually used TikTok I have the app so I can like watch other people's videos and it's not like download the app every like three seconds. Um, but you know, because of data sharing between platforms, uh, because of algorithmic surveillance, uh, I am you know, placed into a category of high risk users um, and it is more beneficial not to uh, allow me on the platform than it is to keep me there and mine all my data. 
Um, and TikTok, like whatever, like it, <laughs> TikTok, stupid, excuse me, stupid. Um, but you know, this happens on Venmo. This happens on Cash App. This notoriously has been happening on PayPal for decades now. Um, and this will happen in bank accounts. Wells Fargo, uh, in particular, shuts down sex workers' accounts at the top of a hat, freezes and seizes our funds. Then you're not able to open up another account at another bank because you know this information is now just just wedded to you. And then how are you supposed to survive in our capitalist hellscape if you don't have a debit card or you know like how? It's it's really just this slow. Uh, I mean, it's just slowly suffocating you by by uh, excluding you from the public sphere, and that doesn't, you know. I think of, I think it's Rob Nixon who wrote "Slow Violence" in 2011 about, um, God, I think it was about like environmentalism. Um, but you know, we don't see this as violence per se, but it's really a, like, I mean, literally, if you can't, if you don't have a credit card, then you'll slowly starve to death, like. That's <laughs> just what will happen. Um, likewise, you know, shadow banning. And I get the, I think the mainstream narrative around shadow banning is that this like happens to conservatives or something. Um, but shadow banning is, uh, you know, a quite regular occurrence for sex workers, obviously, uh, because, you know, we need to be hidden away for others' safety. Um, but if you're shadow banned on, say, Twitter, um, and that's where you make your income, and you're unable to uh, share your site links, share your cash app, uh, post content, because nobody will see it, then there goes your livelihood. It's just this slow, uh, just restriction, kind of one by one of, uh, of the, the, the resources that we all should have access to. Um, so I totally lost my train of thought. Um, but, um, you know, this also, you know, I think it's, and, and I've uh, kind of touched on this, but, uh, but you know, the, the reason that sex workers are allowed to be treated this way um, and largely ignored, if not, you know, have our disappearance celebrated is, of course, due to existing whorephobia. And whorephobia refers to, you know, the intersecting oppressions of, you know, sexism, often racism, often classism, um, that kind of come together and form this distrust and uh, disgust by of sex workers. Um, you know, I think of, like, as, um, as critics like Safiya Noble and Ruha Benjamin have taught us, uh, the internet is not this like equitable place. The like, you know, we're, it's not the great equalizer when we're all hiding behind a screen. I mean, not only because of like digital redlining that keeps uh, internet services more expensive and still slower in like black and uh, low income neighborhoods, um, but through kind of algorithmic uh, privileging of uh, violent ideologies, way that, you know, I, as I uh, kind of gestured to earlier with uh, January 6th, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it really amplifies and intensifies uh, through, you know, whether it's through this rhetoric or through what, through algorithmic privileging of like extreme, um, like politics uh, that, you know, whore phobia is even worse on the internet than it is in, in real life. Um, and the other reason, as I also touched on, is that, again, even if sex workers are being heard, no one cares, right? Um, no one's going to think, like, oh, yeah, it should be easier for my kid to get porn. Like, d d d no one's going to think that. Um, <laughs> and then no one is going to hear to, you know, like, Sides little anecdote, um, last, I think it was last April. Um, oh, how, okay, I've been going 25 minutes. Um, last April, my DoorDash account got suspended 
just like out of nowhere. Um, I went, my friend had just moved to LA and she didn't have any money. She was living in a hostel and I was like, I'm gonna send her a sandwich. So I go to send her a sandwich and DoorDash is like, joke's on you, no food. Um, and I posted something about it on Twitter, like, cause I knew immediately like, oh, this is cause I'm a sex worker, obviously. Um, and you know, this has happened to me on other apps. So I posted something like, oh, love being a sex worker. And uh, you know, a screenshot of the like, your account has been suspended notification. Um, and that went like semi-viral and there were two types of responses in my replies. One was people who were not sex workers being like, Dude, you don't know that. Like, how? No, no. Of course, they can't discriminate against you. That's crazy. That's illegal. Um, and then other sex workers just being like, oh my God, this has happened to me on like three different caviar accounts. Like, I'm so tired. <laughs> like, I just want a burrito. Um, it's actually happened to me, I think, yeah, also on three, three separate occasions. You know, some of this uh, treatment is just so ridiculous in a way. And you know, it makes sense when you think that like, of course DoorDash is going to be sharing data with, I don't know, Facebook. And then if Facebook has figured out you're a sex worker because it noted that you were in such close proximity to all of these other sex workers um, and has you flagged as high risk, then that is going to then spread to these other platforms to just cut your access to everything off, right? But I mean, that also sounds like, like conspiracy theory Nonsense. Um, but I uh, guess to uh, kind of wrap up, um, when thinking about how to have a safer internet uh, for really any marginalized demographic, but especially one actively perceived as a threat, we're not ever going to have a safe intersectional internet um, until we have a safer world, period. We are, that's not gonna happen. There's no equality online. The internet only amplifies um, inequality until we address, or until we you know, protect people and not just you know, content or whatever, or platforms. It's not gonna happen, period. Um, and thinking of ways of how to uh, move forward with that is also difficult because it requires um, a, a, a different way of thinking of governance. In that, you know, imagining a safe internet can never be carceral, right? Like something like FOSTA SESTA, for instance, which was ostensibly designed to protect children, just is, you know, functions uh, alongside, uh, in tandem with carceral state. Uh, it's, it's surveillance. That's never going to bring us a safer internet. Um, and you know, as a function of capitalism too, we think like section 230, right? That protects these platforms um, from crimes, say, that happen on them. Doxing, for instance, is a felony in most states. Um, but <laughs> you know, uh, as I've discovered the hard way, someone doing a felony at you doesn't really, like you don't, there's, you can't be like they they dox me and then they see the docs and they're like okay like who do you need a, like a lawyer <laughs> it's a whole thing um, and that's you know because we um, we can't be thinking about this as you know who is doing something illegal who is violating one another but how are we protecting each other and not how are we protecting these platforms or how are we protecting the state or the law but how are we protecting the individuals who are being targeted or restricted on here. Uh, so to close, um, capitalism's bad and so is doxing. <laughs> <laughs> So because our, uh, all of our speakers gave such uh, fruitful, vibrant presentations, I think that um, instead of having a Q&A right now, maybe I'd invite you to seek them out um, as we go into our lunch break, um, try and talk to them individually. I'm sure they're all very uh, thoughtful about how they'd like to uh, continue the conversation. Um, I'll note that 
uh, because we're also running just a little bit late, maybe I want to give you all a full hour to be able to, to get some food. I've made some arrangements for uh, the speakers to have some of yours provided, um, but for many of you, that might not be um, the occasion. So there is some food immediately on first here. You can also go to the Cal Plaza, which is more like a uh, during the week uh, eating place, so some of the uh, restaurants might be not, might not be as open, and that's on Grand, just past uh, Mocha. And then um, we're also in rather close proximity too to Grand Central Market if you want to do you know the extra couple blocks, and that's down on Hill at mm, what like third, third and fourth right across from the Bradbury building. So I'll just say thank you. Join, join us a uh, applaud for our panelists one more time. Thank you so much, Tom, Sarah, Olivia, and that um, I'll look forward to seeing everyone back here in about an hour. Yeah, thanks. And A&P students and panelists, we can talk about where to get some food here.